Good afternoon and welcome to a Celtic State of Minds Tuesday Bulletin. I'm Natasha Meikle, I'm delighted to be back and I'm also delighted to be joined by Liam Lawrence and James. Now it's been a couple of weeks since I have been on here for various reasons so it's been nice to join you guys on a Tuesday club again and as always there is plenty to talk about in the world of Celtic. Things do not sit still, we keep moving on and there is plenty to discuss today. We're going to be discussing the new signings, the two Korean recruits who joined us yesterday um, and the potential it looks like for others to be announced very shortly as well. We'll have a look at them, where we think they're going to fit into the squad and we'll also have a look back at some of our pre-season games and sort of a bit of an assessment of the squad as a whole. James, I'll come to you first. Um, it's nice to see players finally being announced. I don't think either announced yesterday, Yang and Quan were a particular surprise to any of us who had seen them already being announced as departing by their, their home clubs um, and being photographed on their way to Celtic, of course. So I don't think it was particularly surprising. I think the timing, I think had we done the Korean tour, it probably would have been great timing to announce it as part of that, which I think was probably the original plan. But nonetheless, it's nice to finally have it confirmed and see them in those Celtic tops, isn't it? Yeah, it feels like I've been waiting for ages for the announcement to actually come. We've known about it, as you mentioned, for ages. I think Gang won announced that Yang was leaving the club yeah. about a week and a half ago. Well, we've known for ages, but it's it's good to finally get some more players in the door. I've mentioned over the last sort of week or two that I've been a bit worried by how slow the transfer business has been. I don't know if it's just to do with how slow it is or that we've not spent as much as I would have hoped. I convinced myself from day one that we're going to break the transfer record that we've not done that yet. So I don't know if I'll be satisfied unless we do that. But it's, it's good to get the players in. I don't know if Navrochi's been sort of officially announced. We've seen him in the Celtic top, which is probably as good as he can get of an announcement. I think Celtic must have assumed all the top fans still would have been over in Japan so they could get away with a wee announcement that someone was looking at Lennox Town and got the photo. But that was a problem position that I'd sort of identified from the start of this transfer window. You need to improve at centre-back, especially for the Champions League. And apparently Josip Juranovic gave my recommendation to go to Celtic, even though Navrocki was linked with Union Berlin. It seems a bit strange for him to tell him to move to our club, but that might be the best thing for his development. We've seen so many top players develop at Celtic in recent years, even especially centre-backs. I'd like Van Dijk and Ayer go on to play in Premier League football. But I think uh, centre-back is good with both feet. It's something that we really could use in the Champions League, especially because when Starfield's playing on the left side, he's a right-footed player. It's, it's so awkward to see them have to turn onto his right foot. And it's especially in the Champions League, as I mentioned, when you're getting pressed so hard by these teams, you don't have time to turn onto your right foot and try and pick out the pass. You've got to be getting things done as quick as possible. So that'll be interesting to see. I think we'll probably see over the first three or four games this season where Navrocki fits into the system. If he is our Starfelt replacement, which I don't know if he will be, I think he'll slot in as the third choice centre back for now. But the thing is, with this Celtic team, it's stacked. There's lots of players. It's a very, very big squad. So we're going to need to start trimming things. We've not really sold many players. The only one was a player no one wanted to leave in Jota. The players we think uh, we could probably afford to lose them. They haven't gone yet. So it'll be interesting to see which players we let go as well as the window goes on, see if we can sort of trim the squad a bit. Because I'm thinking with the Champions League, especially to try and fit the quota, you've got to try and uh, you've probably get some homegrown talent in there as well. So it'll be interesting to see what Celtic do for the rest of the window. There is a good bit of squad work to be done, I think, and we'll come on and talk about that. And I think Brendan Rodgers will have had a good opportunity to assess what he has available across these couple of pre-season games we've had so far. But we are going to talk about the, the new recruits and we are going to almost include Narokchi as one of these, given that he has been photographed in Lennox Town in that top. Like you say, there is always someone lurking at Lennox Town to get to to get the photo. So let's let's start there. Let's start with him. What do we know about him? Um, a centre-back, he came up through the Werder Brem system before moving to Legia Warsaw. He's 22 years old. He was born in Germany, but represented Poland internationally through to under-21 level. 
He was named in the provisional squad for the 2022 World Cup, just missing out on the final 26. Something you touched on, James, is that he can play either side. Um, the reports suggest that he's good with the ball at his feet, which is obviously going to suit our system well. Um, but something you've already touched on, you know, who is he coming in to replace? Or is it simply that he is coming in as backup? I think it would be very difficult to split up the partnership of Starfelt and Carter Vickers when they're both fully fit. If Starfelt stays, of course, he has in the last few days been linked with a move to Spartak Moscow. But I think we saw last season how important that partnership is but in particular how important Carter Rickers is to the side and to the defence. And I think we really missed him in the last few games of last season. And I think we've noticed his absence in the preseason games as well. Starfelt is probably the one of the two who comes in for a bit more criticism. He does seem to be the, the whipping boy for a lot of fans, but he has proven to be a great partner for Cameron Carter Rickers and sometimes doesn't get the credit he deserves. And we're talking about bringing in a new centre back. It's probably important to think about the centre backs that we we already have. You know, Kobayashi is still in there. Stephen Welsh is still in there. We've seen Boston Lavell get some game time during preseason. So you know, we are like you've said, James. We are overloaded in that area, and that probably for me, Lawrence, that that's too many centre halves. So where do you go who do you move on um who stays for me i think obviously we're, it's fundamentally important that we keep hold of carter vickers and starfelt um kobayashi for me has yet to prove that he's going to be at the standard we require at celtic but i'm certainly by no means writing him off i'm still excited to see what he can do and how he can develop narachi probably the a good one to get in to push carter vickers and starfelt but where does that leave welsh where does that leave Lawell, even someone like Liam Scales who can play in that position, they probably at this stage, I think, start to have to look at their options, Lawrence. I said, Scales not good enough, sell him. Lowell, maybe put him out. Season's loan, see if he's got it. His B team, you know, it's not a great level to judge him. Welsh, I think he's got to move on for the benefit of his career. Sell him, get some money, reinvest it. Kobayashi, she said, he's not really done it yet. Uh, Starfield, if we are going to sell him, it needs to be now. It's 28. It's either that or we're writing off all the money on him. You know, if you, we've seen it with Jot, if you get a decent bid in for him and, and Rogers has, you know, identified the replacement, he'll be off. Uh, you know, he, as you said, he's a, a weapon boy, but if we don't sell him now, we're kind of, I, I don't think we'll, we'll turn a profit on him in the future then. So, mm. yeah, we've got a lot of players there, but. Scales and, and Welsh, I would, I would say, up for sale straight away. Lowell, out on loan. And it would leave you, you know, Cameron Carter Vickers, Starfelt, Kobayashi, and the new boy. It's four. But yeah, Starfelt might be going. Let's, you know, if, we get, if someone was to offer us 15 million for it for him, I don't think that's a hard decision. You know, you, you're going right, bring someone in. As great as the partnership's been with Cameron Carter Vickers. You know, 15 million is a, a lot of money for a, a 28 year old and where we sit. Mm. Liam, we've got a comment from Scott Mason coming in on YouTube. Thank you for all the comments on YouTube at the moment. There's a lot of them and we'll get through as many as we can, but please do keep them coming in. Scott's agreeing slightly with Lawrence here, saying he sees Welsh moving with Kobayashi being developed and Boson on loan. I think I probably agree with that. I think Welsh is now past the stage of being a young backup centre half. I think that's Lowell's territory now. I think he's probably taken over that mantle and probably he has more room for growth. He has more room to develop. He's younger, although he is 20, you know, he's not a teenager anymore. Um, but he probably is now fitting that sort of young potential player who could go out alone and could come back and, and develop. I think Welsh is probably past that stage. And I think probably for his sake, he would like to go on and get more football somewhere else. So Welsh, I agree with Scott Mason in the comments, is likely to be the one to move on. Boston going out alone. And yes, I agree that Kobayashi definitely has development potential. Scott comes in again with another comment on Narocchi saying that he looks the real deal. He should be battling with Starfelt for a jersey and make sure we always have a solid central defence, which we have lacked since Virgil and Jason. I certainly agree that he will be coming into battle with Starfelt for the jersey. I don't think that's a bad thing at all. I think that that's 
the direction that we want to see us going in. Whether we've not had a solid central defence, Liam, since Virgil and Jason, definitely mm-hmm. a good pairing there. But Starfield and Carter Vickers have, have done pretty well, haven't they? Yeah, um, I, I would also say that I, I liked what I, what I saw of, of Lowell um, during the, the two games over here last week. Um, he, you know, <laughs> we, we shipped a lot of goals in that Yokohama game, but he also made some very good last-ditch interceptions and a couple of really good defensive headers. Um, yeah, I, I liked what I saw of Lawal, and I think there's a player there, but I do agree with Lawrence. I think going out on loan for a, uh, a season, possibly to either another Scottish Premier League team or ideally, for me, an English Championship team. Because mm-hmm. um, that's, you know, slightly better standard than the Premier League in Scotland uh, out with Celtic. Um, but it's also um, a very competitive league because you've got about probably seven or eight teams that could realistically win it. So it's um, it's the kind of competition that that is good for a young player. Um, mm-hmm. Welsh, yeah, I think Welsh is in the same boat as Turnbull. Um, a decent player who you know does what is required of him when he comes in. But unfortunately, when you're not part of the starting lineup, you need to really sparkle when you come in to show that you justify displacing someone that's already part of a winning team. And for me, Welsh doesn't do that. Um, he's fine, serviceable, but he's not in any way outstanding. And however, he has shown that he's good enough to get into the Scotland squad. Mm-hmm. And I think in the same sense as Turnbull, he's going to be looking and thinking, wait a minute, as a Euros coming up next year, chances are, fingers crossed, that Scotland are going to be there. Um, you know, I fancy a bit of that, but I'm going to have to go somewhere where I'm playing every week to get into the squad. So I think Turnbull and Welsh could both be going out the door for the sake of their, their international careers more than anything else. Yeah, no, that's something that I agree with. I think Turnbull's one we're going to come on and talk about later in the show when we get to the midfield, because I think that this... This season is definitely pivotal for him and he's got a big decision to make and I think Brendan Rodgers' assessment of him in the game so far will be fundamental to that decision. Now, obviously, we're still waiting on Narocci being announced. We have seen him with the top on and we've seen him next to our new Korean signings who have been announced. So I want to talk a bit about them as well. Um, Firstly, let's we'll go with the order that Celtic did. Let's talk with talk about Yang Hyun Jun first, um, a 21-year-old. He played 66 games, scoring nine goals for Gang Won. He was the Kaylee Young Player of the season, and we signed him on a deal worth around $2 million. I don't put too much emphasis on the prices that we're playing for some of these players. I don't think um, when we're uncovering some hidden gems like we, we seem to be doing in, in Japan, I don't think the price really reflected the talent. You just have to look at players like Hitati to to realise that. So I don't put too much emphasis on how much we're paying for both of them. Um, but I, this is one I'm certainly excited about. Um, and the players too. You know, he said um, in his opening interview that it's a move he wanted to make happen um, and that he spoke to all who told him great things about the club and the supporters. And he talked about how excited he was to be here. And he actually seemed to to push the move through James. Um, we heard that he was even offering part of his salary at one point if he could make this move happen. So it's great that he wants to be here. I really look forward to seeing what he can bring. And he seems to play mostly as a winger. Rogers just said he's going to increase his attacking options. Um, and with Jota moving outwards, we're not saying that he's a, a direct Jota replacement because I think that'd be pretty hard to do. But it's nice to see us bolster our attacking options. And he's one that I'm excited to see more of obviously winning that sort of Kaylee Young Player of the the Season award. I think that speaks to the potential talent that we're getting here. Yeah, especially if you're shining at a team that's sort of at the lower part of the table as well. Yeah. It's always something good to see. I think according to the chance window, Celtic's plan would have been to add a bit more depth to the wings anyway, a bit more quality waiting in the wings because I think uh, the backup at the right wing would have been James Forrest, who we know is past it. Celtic would be looking for a better option to come off the bench, especially if you're looking to sort of take it to a team in the later stages of a Champions League game. You'd rather someone a bit younger, a bit quicker. So it's good to see Celtic bring another winger in to them, actually, along with Marco Tellio. But I think, I don't think Celtic are going to replace 
Jota. I thought they were going to sign a direct replacement. If we think back to last season, sort of the two the two winners we would play with was Maeda and Jota. And I think this season it's going to be a bad on Maeda. I think that's going to be the starting combination. Mm. So I think there's going to be a lot of emphasis on Leo Abada to step up. I, I tipped him weeks ago to have a big season. I thought he's looked good in pre-season as well. I thought in the Yokohama game especially, he had a a very good game. So I'll be really excited to see what Leo Abada does this season. If this apparent heart-to-heart conversation with Brendan Rodgers is true, and Brendan's had a little word in his ear to convince him, then that's big for Celtic because the, the fees that Abada was getting linked with for a move away was about 10 million, 12 million. We know Leo Abada is worth more than that. We know that has the potential to be worth way more than that. And I think keeping him around and sort of putting the emphasis on him to step up, lead the attack and be the focal point in there. It could lead mm. to a really exciting season for Leo Abada. Yeah, no, I think so. I think it is very important that we have managed to hold on to him, particularly with the Jota moving outwards, Lawrence. And I think, credit to him, I think some of that will have to go down to, to Brendan Rodgers, or so it sounds, or so the, the media push that we're getting sounds like. I don't know if it's too cynic I'll to say that, you know, perhaps this is a story that the club has put out for people to give credit to, to Brendan Rodgers, but maybe I'm just being a cynic. But on the other hand, you know, you can see how a manager coming in and guiding Leo Abada has helped. You know, someone with Brendan Rodgers' experience who has had experience of some big leagues, um, some big clubs, as much as Celtic as a big club. You know, if Leo Abada is looking towards England, who is better to guide him on the current standard in England and his potential in England than someone who's managed there? So he is going to take what Brendan Rodgers has said um, relatively seriously, and he's obviously trusting him to help guide his career. If Brendan has said to him that like, the best place for you right now and your development is here with me at Celtic, it could hinder you having to go down south or somewhere else. I've experienced it. Um, that's probably something Abad has, has taken on board, Lawrence, and he's made the decision to to stay here. Yeah, l- listen, jo- not just Abad, Matt Riley's made some mm-hmm. positive comments about Brendan and the way he engages with the players. So, yeah. It's great that Abada's staying, you know, I was worried that we were going to lose him. I thought he was for the off and it could you know, be a significant intervention in Brendan's part, you know, causing him to stay because his numbers are frightening for a guy that you know, doesn't start very often. You know, he doesn't get a lot of game time, but he still produces the goals and the assists. And, you, you know, I wouldn't say James is past that, you know, twilight of his career, but I, I think he can still turn it on now and again. Uh, you know, is this his 15th season he's going into? Mm-hmm. We'll obviously, it's testimonial coming up. Uh, I've got tickets in the North Stand Lounge, Natasha. I may see you there. Last time yeah, I was going in the North Stand Lounge, the security girls mistook me for Natasha. <laughs> so I was my tickets. They were just like, Natasha? And I went, no. <laughs> but it turned out it was the, just because I was using Natasha's tickets. But uh, yeah. No, I, I thought it was a similarity in the hair colour and stuff like that, Lawrence. No. Well, well, that day it may have been. That day it may have been. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, no, real looking forward to James's test- testimonial. But yeah, we all bad. Get, the guy's an undoubted talent. You're, you're hoping that Brendan can get him more minutes on the pitch. You know, he's arguably you know got more end product than Jota in, in terms of goals and assists. He, he's, I think he's more direct, very quick and exciting player. Yeah, it's. I, th- I think we've done well to keep a hold of him. You know, you, you are worried about. Because there was noises from, I suppose, Christmas onwards. But, you know, mm. he, he was looking that he was wanting away. And he's mm. got a habit of, of scoring in uh, the, the new Glasgow derby as well. Uh, you know, just nipping into the back post, which I hope he continues. But, yeah, great to see that Brendan's having it affecting players. He's getting a buy-in. Uh, mm-hmm. It hasn't stopped us falling behind in the, the closed season cup, as uh, I've been seeing in the papers. But, you know... We'll wait till the real trophies come out, I suppose. Absolutely. Liam, it, it does beg the question, though. Are we starting now to be slightly overloaded on wingers? James touched on it at the top of the show, that we are quite heavy in the centre-back area and that there's players who are likely to be moved on. That's probably going to be the case in terms of the midfield and particularly the wingers I'm looking at at the moment. Just having a think about it, obviously Lawrence has touched on, we've got Forrest there, the Bad is staying, we've added Yang, Maeda can play there, Tilio can play there, Haktabanovic we know can play out there, Johnston still has sort of prepared position, we've got Rocco Bata coming through and getting some game time as well. Jota's moved on, 
But again, I think we're probably in the position that we are slightly overloaded in terms of of wingers. I think for me, like like James touched on, I think it's like very likely to be Abada and Maeda. As much as I'd love to see Maeda sometimes play through the middle, I think it's been very effective there. I think that it's probably an Abada and Maeda to start with. Um, we're yet to see what what Yan can produce. I'm very excited by Tilio. Um, where does that leave players like Haksibanovic, Johnston, Vata? We saw them all get some good game time in the obviously Johnston himself has been injured, but we've seen them. We've seen a bit of Vata. We've seen a good bit of Haksibanovic. They've got a lot of players ahead of them, though, don't they? Yeah, I mean the, the thing I noticed over the last two games was that Haksibanovic, when he was on the pitch, was he didn't really seem to have a defined position. He was kind of mm-hmm. roaming in and out and back and forth and kind of trying to make things happen and plenty of effort, but it wasn't really working for him. And I think that, I think it's one of them that Brendan Rodgers has not yet decided where he's going to deploy Haksibanovic. Um Maeda was playing like a man possessed in those two games last week. So he was, you know, if we need someone to step in to, you know, God forbid if Kyogo gets injured for a long time. Um, mm. Rumors are it's a persistent shoulder injury from lifting too many trophies, but, you know, um, if uh, if, uh, if Kyogo does miss an extended period, then Maeda can definitely step in and play that striking role, as I've been saying for pretty much since we signed him, because that's how I saw him originally over here, uh, mm-hmm. and that's how he plays for the national team. Mm-hmm. Um to me, at the moment, the way I see it, uh, Johnson, Mikey Johnson, is on the way out. He's just, it's no, it's not going to happen for him. Um, I think you're going to have Maeda and Abada are your your first starting wingers, ideally, assuming that you know Kyogo and and or O are fit to play through the middle. You then have Yang and Tilio as the two backups, because again. For Europe, you need to have the depth where you can deploy two players of high standard in every position. And so I think it's good that we have wingers that we can deploy on both flanks and we have the quality there. You know, Brendan Rodgers consistently said over the last few weeks it was about adding quality. When everybody asked him, oh, are you are these project signings? Or, and by the way, I hate that phrase, project signing. Because everybody's a project signing until the first time they score a hat trick, right? That, that's just that's the way it is. You know, once once a player gets gets on the scene and establishes themselves, the the project signing thing goes out the window, regardless of age. Um, but uh, I think that it's uh, yeah, it, it's you know, these players that have come in this week and will come in over the next few days, hopefully more, are about adding to the overall squad. And, you know, to talk a wee bit about, about this uh, Navrochi, I think it's good that he, ha- again, does not have a defined position in the team. Mm-hmm. So there's going to be about three or four different players looking over their shoulder thinking this guy could take my place if I don't step it up. I and that, that's important. good as multiple players, really, if, you, if, it gets, if it makes multiple players that are already there better. I think that's very important, James. And something that we talked about last season um, was the fact that we had wingers like at the time Jota and Abada or Maeda or whoever it was spending 60 minutes going up against the fullback who was chasing their tail for most of it. And after 60 minutes, those players get taken off and the fullback gets to look over to our substitutes bench and we're bringing on maybe it's Maeda or maybe it's, you know, Haksibanovic or whoever is, is coming on to replace them and they're thinking, wow, you know, this isn't going to get any easier for me. All they've done is pressure the legs and the quality hasn't substantially dropped. I think that was so fundamental to our season last season was that strength and depth. And it was the fact that we were able to bring players off in 60, replace them and the quality not drastically drop. And I think it, particularly in the winger positions, that was the case last year. And that's where we got a lot of our, our joy from. Um, and that's where a lot of our really good football happened from. Is that going to be the same again this season? Is that what we're trying to do again? You know, as we've sort of highlighted here in our opinion as fans we think that sort of leading two at the moment are going to be Abada and Maeda um, but is it the case that we're sort of stacking those winging positions because we want to be in that position again of being able to replace them with quality by all accounts you know Tilio who we haven't I haven't seen too much of before his announcement here um, 
is going to be a fantastic signing. Yang on the wings a great signing. And like Laura has said, you know, let's not write off players like James Forrest. And I personally, I don't want to write off players like Rocco Vata. I think he certainly showed excellent potential since he's joined up with the first team squad. And I think the arrival of Brendan Rodgers could be very, very good for a player like that, that's something that Paul John touched on on yesterday's bulletin is that in the the latest preseason game, you really saw Rodgers constantly talking to Vata, constantly instructing him, constantly guiding him through the game. And I wonder if he is one that Brendan himself has highlighted as having real potential this year. Yeah, you've just got to look back to Rodgers' first sort of spell at the club. I know it was Dyer that gave Tierney the initial chance, but it was Rodgers that pushed him on to new levels. And even, I know they might not be the quality that you would want from like a youth academy player. They're not going to set the world alight, but he gave Mikey Johnson and Anthony Ralston their first chances as well. So Rodgers, he's known for trusting the youth. I'd argue he probably trusts the youth a bit more than Ange has in his two years at Celtic. But I think it's good to have lots of options, especially with how sort of hectic the season gets, especially in Scottish football when you've got the league, you've got two cups. And fingers crossed, European football after Christmas. I'm keeping these fingers crossed. So it's good to have that many options. And I think a lot of the players that we have on the bench, they, they, they don't want to be bench players. They want to be pushing for a starting position. They've got to have the hunger to be able to push for that. They can't just be content of sitting on the bench. Guys like, we think you're Turnbulls, or even when Leo Abada was on the bench, these players, they want to push for that starting place. So to have those guys on the bench looking to come on and make an impact, it's great. And I think you see that far more in Scotland in a domestic game than you would see with us in Europe, when you think we're playing against an Aberdeen, they're tired, then you can bring on, as you mentioned, Natasha Lakes of an Abada or a Maeda off the bench. The, the team, they're going to be absolutely crapping themselves. They don't know what to do with some of the options that we bring on. So, especially with the five subs nowadays, having such a sort of depth of quality is absolutely fantastic. It is, it is. I'm just reading through some of the YouTube comments. I'm going to bring up one from Kevin Mullen, who says, after the next one, it feels like we're starting to build our team now with some new signings. Still think we're going to bring quality players in. Just remember, we are building from a position of strength. I think that's a very good point. And I think that's something that makes this transfer window slightly different to ones that we've seen previously. Previous transfer windows, we've needed a rebuild. We've not been building from a position of strength. We've been building from a position of, you know, major work needing done, players needing to come and hit the ground running, massive gaps needing filled. I don't feel that's quite so much the case for Brendan coming in in this transfer window because he's already inherited a very good squad from Postacoglu, a squad who's been very successful. And now it's his job to find the players to take this squad to the next level. And for me, that's finding the players who are going to give us that slight edge in Europe that's going to get us a little bit further than we have been seeing in previous years, which I think has fallen below the standard that we have expected and the standard that we want to see at Celtic. So for Rodgers, it's about finding that talent that can just elevate the success that we've already had under Postacoglu. Um, we've not spoken about him yet. The other one who joined yesterday along with his countryman Yang is Kwon Hayok Q, who I believe we'll be calling Kwon. Um, he is a defensive midfielder, describes a bit of a midfield enforcer. Um, Brendan said that he's a player the club's been aware of for some time um, and that both Brendan and the player are delighted with the move. I saw a photo on social media earlier today um, of Quan standing next to O and we've all seen O. He's tall, he's quite big, he's physical. Quan look, makes him look quite small. Quan is a, a big guy, um, which I'm looking forward to seeing him in action as well. Um, he said in his interview that you know Celtic is very well known back home, that he's sure the support will continue to increase now that there's three South Korean players. Um, and Lawrence, for me, obviously, it's, it's exciting to get the, the talent in. Um, again, not one I know particularly much about it's a league that I certainly don't watch if there's people in the, the comments who do please let us know um but let's just put in the football part aside for for a minute it's good business sense as well and it's something that Quan himself has highlighted that the support will continue now that we are signing more players from South Korea so you know 
on one hand, it's great that we're broadening our horizons and we're tapping into markets which have been less tested here in Scotland and covering, hopefully, gems of players. But from a business perspective as well, Lawrence, it's also, you know, relatively sensible to increase the, the brand reputation across the world, isn't it? Yeah, well, listen, definitely. I think it was like three or four weeks ago, maybe a wee bit longer, that Liam said, you know, what cost the Coglo do it? Done it. it wasn't undiscovered gems. They were the best players in the league. You know, Liam could have told us the Japanese boys we were getting were the best players in the Japanese league. You didn't need a scouting department to tell you that. And it looks like we're continuing that with the Korean boys and, and even the, with the Australian winger, because Jared, you know, had tipped him to join. So in business, in terms of increasing the audience, and all, obviously fitting a model of, of buying at a relatively cheap price and buying the best players in the, in the league, yeah, makes great sense. You, you know, uh, defensive midfield, we've got a few of them now. You know, uh, you know, you've got Callum, you've obviously got James McCarthy still there. You've got Iwata. You, so it's, it's going to be a crowded position there, defensive midfield. But listen, it's, it would appear to be a, a relatively low-risk signing. It's not a lot of money. It's one of the best players in the Korean league. Mm-hmm. Bring him over, see what he can do. And, and, and it's got the added benefit of in increasing their reach or or increasing an audience uh, in the Far East. You know, it's one of the models that that we use as a team, isn't it? Uh, Or as a club, you know, buy low and and, and sell high. And this guy's definitely going to, I suppose, get the potential from from what we've seen of his YouTube reel. But can all look good on YouTube, I suppose. It's true. It's true. Um, I'm bringing up another YouTube comment from Double Denim here who says, we are too heavy in centre midfield, too many to accommodate a three-man central midfield system. Some will have to be sold or loaned. Liam, that's touching on what Lawrence has said as well. And I feel like the conversation is is going to go exactly the same way as it just has us in the wingers and the centre halves. But Mm. we are probably, again too heavy in the centre of the park. We probably do have too many players. And I think what the pre-season games have done and the way that they've been going is given Brendan our chance to look at the squad and um, he's got a big squad it's probably too big a squad and these games have given him a good chance to really assess that we've seen you know relatively wholesale changes in both games we've seen a lot of the squad being utilized throughout those two games Liam and it's probably getting down to the time for Brendan to start to have a think about where he's cutting and where he's keeping obviously you know that is um, up to him and his backroom team, but sitting here as fans, Liam, if you're looking mm. at that centre midfield right now, particularly let's talk about a more sort of defensive centre midfield, are we too heavy there and who needs to go? Well, as an 18 stone man, I know a thing or two about being too heavy. Um, <laughs> the, um, what I would say is that I think that one thing, one common criticism of Celtic under Ange, um, and there weren't, there weren't many criticisms, um, was that we were a wee bit lightweight sometimes, particularly in the midfield. Mm. So I think you, we certainly cannot have, um, we can't have too much physicality. I think bringing in more physically, how should I say, more powerful and uh, dynamic midfielders is definitely a good thing. Um, Iwata is that type, I know he's that type of player. From my limited exposure to Quan, he is also that type of player. Um, I could see a possibility where if we are in a European game, for example, next season, and we have to close out a lead, or we have to, you know, eke out a draw away from home, you could have the defensive midfield three of Quan, Iwata, and McGregor, potentially. Mm. I think that would be an exciting prospect. Um, James McCarthy... um, you know, we talked about my weight. I think that my, my number on the scales is probably almost as high as his squad number, the way things are going for him. Um, he is, a, he's, if he was any further out of the picture, he'd be in a different museum. Um, it's no, a, it's not going to happen for him at Celtic, unfortunately. And it's a shame because, you know, Celtic supporter um, came to us with plenty of experience, but Sometimes it just doesn't work, and his, his one of the he's one of those where it's just not worked. And uh, I wish him well wherever he goes next, but he will be, I think, one of the first ones out the door in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, that's something I agree with. Um, James, we'll talk about some of the other midfield as well because you know 
that sort of Awata Kwan position, McCarthy position isn't really is one that you know we we are maybe slightly too many on McCarthy probably the one to to move on but we are also quite heavy otherwise in the midfield as well obviously Callum McGregor is someone who is absolutely not up for debate he is staying and playing every single game that he is fit but we have seen good use of a lot of the other players um during the preseason for me Hatati is one that we absolutely must hold on to and it'll be a successful transfer window if we get through it holding on to Hitati. I had slightly hoped that we might see a contract extension coming his way along with Kyogo and Maeda, but it doesn't um it certainly hasn't been announced yet. But I'm very hopeful that we do hold on to him. I think he's been absolutely quality quality last season. He's been quality in the preseason out things that we've seen. Um but let's talk about players like O'Reilly. Let's talk about David Turnbull, you know, because I think this is going to be a real turning point for them comments are coming in on both of them on youtube we've got paul coming in saying o'reilly will thrive under brendan i'm convinced of that top class we've got bygone era coming in saying turnbull will not be getting near that team andrew's coming in disagreeing with paul saying o'reilly is too soft for me i think you know these are two players who are going to have real battles in their hands at the moment. I've been very impressed with O'Reilly in particular during the preseason. Turnbull before this preseason was probably one I would have had heading towards the exit. If you'd asked me to write a list of players that I thought would leave before the preseason games, Turnbull would be relatively high on that list. I didn't think he had much chance of getting in in front of the players that were in front of him. Um, But O'Reilly, I thought this was going to be a pivotal season for him and he's going to be a very important part of Roger's squad watching the games Turnbull impressed me more than I thought he might James what's your assessment of of both of them I suppose it's similar to what Liam was saying so about 15 20 minutes ago on David Turnbull where mm-hmm. he'll have his own ambitions and he will be wanting to break it in that Scotland squad I remember <coughs> he was in and around the team before I think it was the Euros. He was playing a couple of the friendlies before um, Euro 2021. But since then, he's sort of dropped out of the Celtic team, badly timed injury, coinciding with O'Reilly and Hattati joining the team. So it was just sort of hard to get back into the team from then, and which is why I was a bit confused with the amount of midfielders we've signed, considering how settled our starting midfield trio is. You know it's going to be McGregor, Hattati, O'Reilly. And unless we buy someone for £10 million, no one's going to displace any of them. I'm always quite wary when we sign a player that plays a similar position to the captain, because you saw it back when Scott Brown was playing, and now with Cal McGregor, if you sign a defensive midfielder, they're not really going to play, because you're not going to drop Cal McGregor. Tomoki Watt hasn't seen as much minutes. I don't know if he will see as many now. I think it'll be all about the League Cup in Scottish Cup daily rounds, mm-hmm. trying to see some of these midfielders, but I've tipped O'Reilly for big things this season. He can do Someone mentioned he was soft. I think he's one of the sort of more aggressive players. Someone likes to get stuck in in our team. We saw that when he sort of slotted back in to the defensive midfield role while Cal McGregor was out injured. That's why yeah. some of his numbers were lower than some people might have expected. Although I think he was still the top assister in the league. His numbers were still very, very good. I think Hatati, we all know the quality he has. Um, he always seems to shine in pre-season as well. I remember last season in pre-season, everybody was tipping him for player of the year, myself included, just because of... So how good he was, but we've not touched on him yet. But I'm sort of really looking forward to see Odin Holm. He's um the fickle type that sort of falls for the tags like Golden Boy Awards and things like that. <laughs> so when I see him sort of in talk for things like that, it gets me quite excited. I, mean, I didn't really get to see much of him in the game against Gamble Osaka. I wasn't really able to watch the game. I was travelling when the match was on, but I'll be interested to see how much game time he gets. I think he was the first signing this season. Oh first player Rodgers had to approve that was already in talks when he was joining the team so he's someone I'm really excited to see where he fits in and um, because we're paid what two and a half million pounds from and he seems to have a bit of a reputation that precedes him so let's hope he can he can do something he's probably the player I'm most excited to see out of the new signings. Yeah no I was excited when I saw him coming on to make his his debut in Osaka Um, to be honest I don't think we saw too much of him during that game um, I thought the glimpses we did see, he looked pretty tidy on the ball. Um, but I don't think we got enough of him during those 45 minutes to get a, a really good assessment, Lawrence. But 
he's one that I'm excited to see more of. And I think we might probably, he could be one that we are likely to see a bit more of um, over in Ireland when that game comes this weekend. But Lawrence, if the midfield, looking at it, the midfield that we've got at the moment, maybe trim a few of the, the types of players like McCarthy. I think we're in a, a pretty good position with it as it is. Yeah, listen, midfield, wings, pretty happy there. Could maybe do with another striker. Could definitely do with a, a goalkeeper. You know, Bain is, Bain's not back up. Segrist, you know, these Achilles, there's rumours he's looking to move to Australia. You know, Joe Hart's been a great signing for us. He's not getting any younger and he, you know, on pre-season evidence, he's not getting any better. So, yeah, but, but maybe need. Maybe that's where we'll be looking at signing next. Well, defensively, we've got some injury worries at the moment, but we'll, we'll come through those, won't we? You know, and, and Burnaby had a decent pre-season, so maybe he's going to give Taylor some competition at left back. Is there a can Tony Ralston confound us all again and and, and give uh, Alistair Johnson competition? You know, he does it every season. Everyone doesn't it, Tony? So, but I'd say kind of goalkeeper and strikers, maybe where we're or looking to bring people in. Uh, yeah, I definitely think the comments are agreeing with you on that one. James comes in on YouTube saying we need a decent goalkeeper for Champions League. Um, Danielle comes in saying we need a decent backup right back as well. So I think that there are positions, as much as you know, we are encouraged by the signings that we have made, um, I think there are still positions that we do need to strengthen and I think the goalkeeping one is one that is likely to come up um regularly when we're having these discussions Liam for me you know Hart was absolutely vital when he came in he didn't only address the goalkeeping position and um, which had been causing Celtic problems before his arrival it was his experience his character that helped get the club through a very difficult transition period he stabilized that back line he helped settle a new side a new defense um but as many of the comments coming in are saying you know time moves on he is getting older he's not got long left in his contract if we progress to the next level in europe as we identified was the the goal earlier in the show if we're looking to do that then perhaps heart is the position that we are going to need an upgrade at um do we have that within the squad at the moment um for me i'm not sure um Segrist, he was Fantastic, I thought, for Dundee United when he was there. We've not had a chance to see that at Celtic so far. Obviously, there's been a bit of a, a recurring injury as well. Bain, I don't think he's looked particularly convincing when he's been given the opportunity. So for me, I'm not sure we do have the ability in the squad currently to replace Hart. So it might be necessary to look elsewhere. But that's, that's risky. And um, we've seen it before. Paul's coming in on the chat to say there's no guarantee a new goalkeeper would be better than Hart. And that's certainly the case. Barkas had a very good reputation before he arrived. He looked like a very good goalkeeper. So for me, it's one that's going to be very difficult to replace Joe Hart. I am sure there are very talented goalkeepers out there, but it's a risky position to try and change. For me, I think the ideal scenario would be to get in a good quality goalkeeper now who is pushing Hart all season for that number one spot, maybe playing the cup matches with a view to fully taking over from Hart, either when he's ready to this season or certainly from next season as well, Liam. What's your thoughts on the, the goalkeeping position? Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw a wild one out there for people to think about. Um the uh I think with the goalkeeping position, we should take the same approach that we did when we signed Odson Edward. If you remember, we brought him in while Moussa Dembele was still there. And they trained together, played together for a time, but it was clear that in the fullness of time, Edward was going to supersede Dembele as the main striker. Um, I think, like you say, get a goalkeeper in now, but make it clear that Joe Hart is still the number one. Um, and this is simply to to push him and to challenge him. And you'll you'll not find many goalkeepers in world football with more experience than Joe Hart. So what a fantastic guy to train beside for a young goalkeeper. And a name that I'm going to throw out there, a guy who I thought had a superb game at the weekend, is uh, Kose Tani, the 22-year-old uh, Gamba Osaka goalkeeper. 
Mm. He's only played, I think, about 10 games for Gamba's first team. But, I mean, if you saw that save he made from Maeda in the first half, his handling was good. At six foot three, he is quite imposing for a, particularly for a Japanese goalkeeper. And um, I realise I'm going against the grain here because I've often said the one area where you don't sign Japanese players is goalkeepers. But this guy looks the business. And, you know, even though Gamba lost um, that game ultimately, he was carried off by his teammates and given a standing ovation. Um, he was not the one that, that, that shipped the winning goal, by the way. He'd already been substituted by that point, just to make that clear. Um but yeah, he is, I don't think he's even established as Gamba's number one keeper at the moment, but he is definitely one for the future. Young, hungry, raw talent. I'd say get him in. You'd get him for probably less than a million quid. Uh, already been on the fringes of the Japan international team. Um, definitely one to want to think about. What about the Asian Cup team though, you know? Because we, we face losing a lot of players, but fewer to lose. Well, the the thing with the thing with with somebody like Tani though, if you look at the way Moriasu manages the team, and he's just signed that, an extension to to manage Japan for the next three or four years, so he's going to be the manager of the Asian Cup. He doesn't just bring in young players like that. Um, he beds guys in over a couple of years. So even if Tani went to Celtic right now and in the first team and had a great season, he's not going to be Japan's starting goalkeeper at the Asian Cup. It's it's just not going to happen. It's too soon. I mean, think Kyogo has had two fantastic years, and he's only just getting back into the Japan team now. So, um, and the thing is with the Asian Cup, we have, I believe, we are allowed to postpone. I think it's two or three matches um, if we have X number of players away at the tournament. Which, considering that Korea and Japan are both going to be there, we will have, I think, more than five players away at the tournament. Mm -hmm. um, there's also Australia, um, Tilio potentially. Um, so, actually, Aaron Moy retiring kind of takes the pressure off us a wee bit now. If you look at the list, if you do look at the list of potential players that we could lose to the Asian Cup, obviously pending them all being selected, um, you've got Hatati, Kyogo, Maeda, O, Awata, Tilio, Yang, Kwan. That is a heavy section of the He's team. He's still in the books, isn't he? Gucci's mm. still in the books. Of course. Of course. You know, so pending all of them getting selected, I know particularly from the, the Japanese perspective, um, Kyogo and Hitachi haven't featured as much, but I think they're starting to get a bit more attention now, and I think that's likely to, their international exposure is likely to increase coming up. Um, Kwon and Yang, um, haven't featured yet um, regularly for the the full um, Korean side. Um, they've both been featured at youth level and had some games with the the senior side, but not absolute confirmed starters. But if all those players are to have you know a good a good few months for Celtic and are to get selected for their national teams, that's that's a heavy chunk of the squad, isn't it, James? Yeah, it's. Uh, I was just going to mention there. That's both our strikers, Kyogo and O, gone. And Dyson Maeda, who Liam talked about potentially somebody who could slot in there if need be in some emergency scenario, he's gone as well. So then you're looking at Leah Labada through the middle. So the, the options look... Are Yeti's still here? Are Yeti's still, Yeti still here? Don't forget about oh, him. You can't forget about him. <laughs> but we were talking about how sort of stacked the squad is and then something like that comes along and all of a sudden you're thinking, mm. what are we going to do? So we'll need to see sort of how Celtic get their way through that. I think we, we've seen a bad play through the middle before. I thought he was pretty decent there. So you mentioned just on the, the right-backs and the goalkeepers. Mm -hmm. I think just on Anthony Ralston, I think people are being a bit harsh on Anthony Ralston. I think last season was a pretty difficult one for him because of I think all of it comes down to injuries. Then he was had an injury hit, I think it was sort of like the first half of the season, where he was hit really bad by injuries at the end of the second half of the season. The game time was inconsistent. He started to shine in Andrew's first season because he was getting some consistent minutes that he hadn't really seen before. They hadn't seen the opportunities that he had then. When he wasn't getting it last season either, and you saw his sort of game fell off a cliff. I remember 
Burnaby was sort of the main target that was getting all the sticks, but I thought Anthony Ralston had a far better, a far worse, sorry, tail end to the season than Burnaby. But I think the fans have been a bit too harsh on Anthony Ralston. We, we could probably use a better option there as far as European competition goes, but if you're looking at like an option for the domestic game, Anthony Ralston's a Scotland international. Mm-hmm. You're, you're, you're going to struggle to find sort of a better backup option. Than him, I think the option I would have taken was Max Johnson, the Motherwell right back, who's just got his move to Stormgrass yeah. in the Austrian league. Especially when you think about Celtic meeting the homegrown quota as well. Right now, we're filling that quota out with sort of players from the youth team. I think with how stacked the squad is, someone is going to need to miss out, whether it be a UK Kobayashi or a, perhaps a Tomoki Iwata. Someone's going to need to miss out. Someone's going to need to be sacrificed. So. Uh, it'll be interesting. Keep an eye on when the, we do announce the squad because you know, we'll need to have a look out and see who's missing it. It shows where sort of, they stand in Rogers' assessment of the squad as well. No, it will certainly be interesting to see when that squad comes out. I do want to, just before we finish up, because we do only have 10 minutes left, I do want to move away for a minute from the men's squad and talk a little bit about the women's squad as well and um, the winner back in action tomorrow night um, in Airdrie playing Partick Thistle in the Glasgow Cup. That's a 7.45 kickoff in Airdrie. Um, if anyone is missing their live football fix, if you aren't making it over to the Dublin at the weekend either, there is um, live Celtic football tomorrow night. Tonight as well, I suppose the B team are playing tonight um, in Airdrie as well, but the women are also playing tomorrow night in um, the first competitive game in the Glasgow Cup, but talking about squads, incomings, departures, it's been a bit concerning for the Celtic women's team over the pre season. Um, of so course, Chloe Craig last... signed on, no, eh? So, Chloe Craig signed a, a new contract, yeah, uh, that is good news. Um, but I think Tash is you know, in terms of what happened last season, I think you know, we won that trophy, we saw the increase in crowds and engagement. There's a real good positive feeling about the club, and I felt that women's football at Celtic was really on the ascendancy and I was really hoping that we would build on that, strengthen the squad with a view to really winning the league next season. You know, I, I, I can tell hopefully we, ha- we, we have the resources to do it. Unfortunately, that doesn't seem to be the case. It doesn't seem to be the direction we're going in. Um, we do know, we've talked about it on this show before, that it's intrinsic of women's football that there are short-term contracts. So a lot of contracts were up at the end of last season and unfortunately, it appears that the club did not make these players good enough offers to stay at the club. Um, we're operating on a budget lower than our rivals. We have operated on a budget that's the fourth highest in the league this season. Means As a result, we've lost key players. We've lost the goalkeeper, Tajina. We've lost Jacinta. Tasha Flint didn't stay after her loan. Liv Ferguson is gone. Taylor Otto, Claire O'Riordan. So it's a real sense among, you know, the the fans that this has absolutely killed any momentum that was happening towards the end of last season with such wholesale changes. There has been incomings. Kavanaugh, we signed from Rangers. Um, Addy, Munoz, Jenny Smith. Um, So there have been incomings. We've seen some contracts extended. We've seen Kelly Clark get a new deal. We've seen Chloe Craig get a new deal, who have all been... Caitlin Hayes, of course, got hers at the end of last season, who have all been important... But I think, Lawrence, I know that you're a big supporter of the women's game and of the women's team. I think that we expect, as Celtic, to see our team strive to be the best, to dominate Scottish football, whether that be the men's team or the women's team. And for me, it seems like there's a bit of lack of ambition at the moment to do that with the women's team um, and to continue to grow and to be the best in Scotland. And I think if this was the men's team, I don't think there would be an acceptance of the way that things happened over pre-season, but with the women's team, I don't know why we should accept having, you know, the, the fourth budget in the league. Yeah. Listen, Fran's been doing an outstanding job, but the fourth budget in the league, you know, you'd expect it to be the first or second. I know uh, Rangers got some sponsorship from the Far East, which, uh, yeah, it's given them a, a budget way above what we can afford, but for two other clubs to be higher than us, it, it, it's ridiculous. Tash Flint, you know, what an impact she had when she came in. Same with Love Ferguson. And y- y- you thought, you know, that the club, if they wanted to do something, would have secured those two players. I'm not too sure what happened with, with Jacinta's move. 
obviously we, we signed her, what was it, from Napoli. She, she was under with West Ham, but we, we got direct from Napoli, didn't we? So, yeah, it it doesn't look as if they're pushing the boat out in terms of signings. Uh, Mark Butchell's girl still coming through, isn't she? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, it's Tyree Butchell, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely under investment. Playing the games in Airdrie, it's not great. Look at look at the atmosphere at Celtic Park. And oh, what a cruel way to lose it. You, you know, yeah. Thought that, Stumble thought over that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, a couple of years ago, there was plans for it, the stadium at, at Barrafield. I thought that's what maybe they were going to do. But Airdrie's not the place. They need to get it. More games at Celtic Park and, and maybe push ahead with the with the Barrafield Stadium. I used to love going watching the reserves there. And I, I think, you know, even the B team would benefit from being games closer to Celtic Park, you know, ideally at Barrafield or as many as they can at Celtic Park. We heard all the great things about the Deso Tough and how robust it was going to be and it would allow uh, more games and potentially concerts, but it, it, it doesn't seem to have come to fruition that. But mm. it, yeah, I, I don't know why there's such underinvestment, whether it's the people that are charged with getting sponsorship in for them aren't doing it. But there was certainly interest. What was that again? Was that about 11,000? For, for it's 15,000 at one point, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, the, there's a demand there. You, you, you know, people will come and watch it, especially if it's at Celtic Park or near Celtic Park. Yeah. Yep. No, exactly. The, exactly. I think that the, the frustrating part is that, you know, the fa- I think the fans showed the buy in at the end of the last season. The fans invested, the fans turned up, the fans supported it. And if the club don't appear to be doing the same, then the concern is that that support drops off because, you know, why should people give their time, their effort, their interest into the game when the club aren't doing the same? And the women's team have a cracking band of, like, core supporters. They really do, who turn up absolutely everywhere, every week, home and away, regardless of where it is. Um, that, that game I was confused for you. For can go. There was a, a family down for Oban mm-hmm. to see the women's team. You know, apparently they, they travel about and, and watch the women's team. That's what they do. It's more affordable for them. It's yeah, the, 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 there's potential there. We, we, we show, you know, the fans are interested. Sixteen thousand people at a game. Jeez, that'd be the third biggest supported game in Scotland most weekends. You know, so the, the, the club definitely need to do more. Uh, hopefully, get more sponsorship in there. Mm. We've got a Chinese winger out of the is, is Mengo out of the, the World Cup. She was captain yeah. last season. Really exciting. You know, can, can definitely be. Beat a player or two, so you know Fran's got the bones of a good squad there. If mm-hmm. we kept Tash Flint and, and Lib Ferguson, who knows? But I know, and obviously there are thing. there are big wages getting offered from other places. Of course they are, and I'm not suggesting that we can compete with some of the money that is apparent in England as a result of their television deal. But James, you do want Celtic to at least be competing and, and not competing with with maybe the Liverpools and the Chelsea's and the Man United's down south. But I want us to be competing with Rangers. I want us to be competing with Glasgow City. I certainly want us to be competing with Hibs and Hearts. We shouldn't actually even be com- competing at that level, given the resources that Celtic have as a, as a club. We shouldn't be in a position that they're outspending us. Yeah, if I remember, Kent, I think we're in a similar position before the booming season last summer as well. There was a bit of panic about sort of how prepared mm-hmm. the club were. I remember that was at one of Fran Alonso's press conferences I was asking them about the, the lack of signings when you consider the players that had gone out the door. Mm-hmm. So hopefully, a bit like last season, Celtic can get the finger out and get some signings in the door, especially with the, the Women's Champions League. I'm not sure, Natasha, do you know where we enter the Women's Champions League? Where, which yes, it's a very went? complicated format. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll cover it before, before the game comes in, but it's almost like a mini-tournament. Um, mm. There's another three teams in our wee group of four, um, we play is it like the a first qualifier one. group, or is yeah, it uh, at the early stage? Yes, yeah, so we play. We play our first um, round, and then the winners of those two then go on to to play a final to decide who who goes through, and others play a sort of third, fourth place playoff. The games are going to be hosted in Norway at the start of September. Um, so you know there is time to to get the new squad sort of bedded in, get a few games under our belt before we play in those games. But they are going to be a very very tough test. It's been encouraging to see, of course, that we've got girls playing at the highest level. There's girls at the World Cup, like Laura's touch on, touched on Mengu's 
out there playing for, for China. That's and good experience and playing against these as well. European mm-hmm. teams as mm-hmm. well. We saw that with the, the B team last season. The amount of um, Darnell Day and Stephen McManus were mentioning it, and a lot of the players were mentioning it as well, playing against teams like the Real Madrid Academy, the RB Leipzig yeah. Academy. It helps develop the team because as the Celtic B team, you're not beating a team 8 0, 9 0. In fact, these are teams that are going to come at you. It's like big games that you get against Glasgow City and Rangers, but every sort of every match day in, in the Women's Champions League. Yeah, well, no, I think it will be exciting to see. It's great to see the club represented, you know, at the World Cup. It'll be great to see them represented at the Women's Champions League as well. Um, and hopefully, we've got a, a good squad to go on and compete in that as well. We are at we are at an hour. Um, thank you to, to everyone who's commented. There's been loads of comments coming today. Got through a good few of them. Thank you for continuing to watch the bulletin. Um, a wee reminder that Axon have a new show out as well. Um, Paul John is doing a wander around paradise, um, and a new episode of that came out last night. So head to the YouTube channel to check that out. It's a really Really good feature, something new to, to Axom. And if you've not seen it already, I do think you will enjoy it. So make sure you check that out. Um, but for now, Lawrence, James, Liam, thank you for joining me. Everyone in the comments, thank you for joining us. Pasha, and look we're going to see to- something on a Friday night. And a, a bad for the, the Roy Aiken gig. Big Roy. Give the plug, Lawrence. I'll pass it over yes. to you. <laughs> Only child of Celtic Football Club. You know, mm-hmm. one of Jock Steen's last signings, uh, harshly treated by referees in, in Scotland, almost chased out uh, in the country by them. But really looking forward to the gig. He, you know, he's not uh, done many of these before. So it'll be interesting to, to get a take on Celtic, you know, from the 70s uh, through to the late 80s. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and Roy's view on it. Uh, great captain for us. You know, I remember charging up the wing, 85 cup final, and oh, what a header be Frank. What an absolute storm in a header. How you got that in the top corner, who knows. But, mental, but hopefully see you on Friday night at Bad. Yeah, there's not many tickets left for that. Um, less than 20, I think, we're on now. So if you do want to be there at Bad on Friday night to see and listen to Roy Ken with Paul Judd Bikes, then get over to our social media channels for more details on how you can get tickets for that one. It'll be a great night and hope to see some of you there but for now thank you for joining us today on a Celtic State.